The story you are about to hear is one of the most bizarre in the annals of international bus history. These are buses that caused a rift between two allies. These are the buses that angered a president of the United States. These are the buses that were doomed from the beginning. This is the Cuban bus crisis of 1964. Hi, this is Jeffrey, and I'm sure all of you have heard of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, the story you are about to hear is what I call the Cuban Bus Crisis of 1964. You see, what happened is, in the early 1960s, British Leyland made a deal with the Cuban government to send them 400 Leyland Olympic buses. Now, this caught the attention of the Johnson administration in the United States because there was a trade embargo against Cuba, and the U.S. did not want any of its allies to send Cuba anything of any real value. Well, the British decided to go ahead with this deal anyway and send them the first batch of 42 buses. Well, that ship that, it, that the buses were sent on never made it to Cuba. In fact, it never even made it out of the UK, but it, you know, it capsized and many of the buses were lost. Now, that's the first part of the story. The second part of the story is that it was believed by some that there was sabotage involved and espionage involved by the CIA, all because of buses. So, we're going to take a look at this whole story. Now, the first part is we're going to review an article about the rift between the United States and Great Britain in 1964 when Britain decided to sell Cuba these buses. And the second part of the story, we're going to look at why there's possibly sabotage and espionage involved that wanted to prevent those buses from going to Cuba. So let's get started in reviewing these very interesting stories about this really interesting bus incident that happened in early 1964. And here's the article from the Daily Mirror by way of AR Online, titled Row with U.S. Over Bus Deal by Gordon Jeffery, dated January 8, 1964. A buses for Cuba row blew up last night between Britain and America. A British firm's $4 million order to supply Castro's Cuba with 400 buses and spare parts brought a sharp protest in Washington. Mr. Robert McCluskey, a State Department spokesman, told a press conference, We, of course, regret the sale. It certainly does not help in our efforts to isolate the Cuban regime and thereby weaken the economy. He claimed that some time ago, the Kennedy administration protested against the deal. In London, foreign office officials were stunned by the protest against the order for Leyland Motors. They said they had no record of any formal U.S. protest. They pointed out that the only Cuba export boycott operated by Britain was on military and other strategic items. Whitehall officials said America's current sale of $90 million worth of wheat to Russia made her Cuban bus protest somewhat ludicrous. Late last night, Leyland's managing director, Mr. Donald Stokes, said he found that because of the U.S. embargo, no British ship owner would take the buses to Cuba. A week or so ago, I wrote to the Board of Trade asking to borrow an aircraft carrier, he said. We are still waiting for an answer. We had to get something done, so we approached the East German shipping line. It was a shot in the dark that came off. Delivery will take 12 months. Referring to reports that the U.S. State Department had expressed regret at the deal, Mr. Stokes said, I am sorry they disapprove, but this is an English company doing a deal with Cuba. We did not have a press conference when the Americans sold wheat to Russia. I have no knowledge of having to go to America for permission to sell buses. This is just a repeat order from a traditional customer of ours. This is a preliminary they want 1,450 buses altogether. 
Referring to the U.S. ban on strategic material for Cuba, he said, You cannot go to war in these buses. They are intended for paved city roads. You would look, and you would look like an awful mug trying to go and fight in them. President Johnson is really angry. The Leyland Order could queer the atmosphere for Premier Sir Alec Douglas Holmes' visit next month. The President is said to be itching to make a personal protest on the phone to Sir Alec. America normally blacklists ships which carry banned goods to Cuba, but this threat will hardly deter the communist East Germans from shipping the buses to their ally Castro. Leyland's managing director, Donald Stokes, defends his company's deal to sell buses to Cuba. You would look damn silly going to war in a bus. Anyway, we haven't had any war with Cuba, and we buy sugar from them. Cuba is a traditional market as far as we are concerned. We sold them buses worth $10 million in 1949 and 6 to $7 million in 1959. We also sell buses to Poland and Bulgaria and places like that. These buses are not strategic war, war material. And that's the end of the article. Okay, so now that we know this story of Britain selling Cuba 400 Leyland Olympic buses, let's find out what happened on that fateful night when the first shipment of 42 buses was sent to Cuba. And here's the article that describes the second part of this story. This is from The Guardian by way of the Taipei Times, dated Monday, October 27, 2008, and it's titled, Documents Indicate CIA May Have Sunk Ship in UK in 1964, and there is no author attributed. On a chilly October night in 1964, the shipping forecast warned of fog on the Thames. Just after midnight, an East German freighter, the MV Magdeburg, slipped out of her Dagenham dock near London and headed slowly downriver. On deck were 42 Leyland buses bound for Cuba. Coming the other way was the Yamashiro Maru, a Japanese ship sailing empty. The ships met at 1.52 a.m. The Magdeburg was making the tight turnaround broadness point when the Yamashiro Maru plowed into her starboard side at more than 10 knots, holding her below the waterline and pushing her across the river. It was an accident, an act of God, said Keith Toms, a tug crewman on the Thames that night. And that was the conclusion. No one was killed, there was no inquiry, and no one was accountable, and only Leyland Motors, forced to replace the buses, suffered. Now a historian has found documents that add weight to the suspicions of academics that the ship was rammed at the behest of the CIA as part of an effort to sabotage anyone breaking the U.S. embargo on Cuba. With the U.S. Threatened, threatening to blacklist any ship owner breaking the transportation blockade, Leyland Motors decided to use an East German ship. It was in the maritime archives of the former German Democratic Republic that academic John McGarry found evidence given by Gordon Greenfield, the British pilot of the Magdeburg, stating that the Japanese ship broke international law by navigating the wrong way and giving misleading signals. The captain and pilot of the Yamashiro Maru refused to speak. McGarry believes a wrong was committed. I felt that the question of CIA involvement might be resolved by an examination of the pilot's logs which were supposed to be stored at Trinity House and in the Port of London archives. They cannot be found. The East German papers show Greenfield was deceived by someone on the Yamashiro Maru who sounded a sing single siren blast before the collision, an intention to pass port to port, he said. Greenfield said in his statement, the Yamashiro Maru appeared to sail towards the south of the Middle Channel but I interpreted her exchange of signals to mean that she was about to turn to starboard in order to pass me on her port side. At this time, there seemed to be no danger of a collision. Tracked down 44 years later, Greenfield said, 
Given the atmosphere of the day, I suppose it's not surprising people read something into what happened, but there's no truth in it. There was no blame attached. He said that despite reports of thick fog, visibility was so good that the two ships saw each other well before Broadness Point. In 1975, Washington Post reporters Jack Anderson and Les Witten cited sources who claimed that a British wiretap on Cuban offices in London gave the CIA the ship's movements. Harold Ellison, director of the New Security Foundation in Berlin, said, I, It would have to be naive to think that the CIA wouldn't dare sink an East German ship in the vital estuary of a NATO ally. They were under pressure to get results, and they had a huge budget for sabotage. And that's the end of the article. Wow, that was some story, wasn't it? Buses, international intrigue, sabotage, espionage. It has, it has it all. It would make a great movie, wouldn't it? Now, I'm not going to say either way if it was intentional or if it was an accident, because we will probably never know, although there's a lot of suspicious things going on here. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this look at what I call the Cuban bus crisis of 1964. And thank you very, very much for watching, and as always, have a great day. Bye.